Hi. Uh, so if you just saw the presentation we gave, this is exactly the same stuff. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now, hopefully this will be good. Show Mariana Rivera on a loop again <laughs> and again and again. Um, but we're not, we don't really want to just jam at everyone here for 45 minutes. So if there are, as we discuss different projects, if you want to ask a question or anything, just raise your hand and I'll then repeat the question. We can maybe get a little discussion going. But we do have, we do have more projects we want to talk about, so we'll sort of start there and see how it goes. Uh, and one thing too is just like, uh, like we work with an incredibly talented group of people in the department, so that's uh, most of them there. Some of them uh, in from, oh, sorry. Uh, uh, we, do, we do work with an incredibly talented group of people in the department, so that is uh, most of the department there. So this is a lot of their work we're uh, going to be showing um, and talking about, so I just wanted to give credit to them. All right, so, so uh, like one of the things that we like, like we'll just run through some of the things that we think about is like we approach any process in our thinking process and how we approach like how do we settle in and like what visualization form do we want to use, like uh, what should this graphic look like, is, is it even a graphic? Um, and I think the thing probably that's worth emphasizing the most is that um, if you look at what like our best graphics, the best graphics that we do are the ones that we've like actually put a substantial amount of reporting and research into. Because without actually like without actually doing that reporting and research, like you're not going to know the topic. Like, and uh, we work in a newsroom. We have about 30 people in the newsroom in the graphics department. There's a the newsroom has I think about 1,100 people total, and probably 500 of those people are reporters. And so like often. Like what ha how we actually generate ideas is like it's a mix. Like some are things that we do, some are things that reporters like come over and say, "Hey, I'm doing a story about the unemployment rate." Like can I do a chart, um, and others are ones where say, "Hey, I'm doing an interesting story," um, but I don't know. It seems like there might be a graphic there. It seems like there might be data, um, and so the ones that are the best are like you think of the best ideas as you actually are doing the reporting and. Uh, learning about the data, because that's when the ideas come to you, when you actually know what all the data is out there, you can figure out, okay, what, like, what is the story I'm trying to tell with that data? So, so we'll start with um, a piece that ran earlier this year. It's a story by a reporter named Jody Cantor about uh, gender equity at Harvard Business School as part of a series she's doing on gender. And, and the piece got into, you know, both the experience, experiences men and women were having in the business school, the students, and also uh, faculty. Um, and so Hannah Fairfield, who's <clears throat> one of the graphics editors, um, you know, was kind of managing the, the project from us, uh, trying to figure out which visualizations would make sense. And, you know, I mean, to tie into what Matt was saying, you know, often the best data set is not one that's uh, already compiled for us. You know, um, there are members of the graphics department who are really excellent reporters, and, you know, we can assemble uh, data sets in different ways, and some of it is, is by reporting in ways that are very similar to the ways that the, the reporter writer is, is working. So Hannah, in this case, you know, started just thinking uh, about the faculty. And uh, since the piece kind of got into whether or not Harvard was actually, um, you know, trying to sort of balance the men and women as members of the fact faculty, um, she wanted to explore the idea of, uh, you know, men and women in the pipeline to become tenured professors. And, you know, Harvard, you know, refused to provide any kind of granular data on its 250 faculty members. And uh, so she started to try to gather it herself. She went to, like, a professor, professor's website. Some of them have CVs. And so she uh, started to mark kind of when they started and when they got tenure. And, and then she started to make some calls to uh, other professors, and some of them very willingly gave her the information. And some of them, you know, sort of connected her to the communications department. Um, which is, you know, where reporting starts to get difficult because then you, you are starting to interact with, uh, you know, someone who is not necessarily interested in giving you all the information you want. Um, so there was a kind of an ongoing negotiation that she had, you know, explaining what she wanted to explore and that she had a certain amount of information and that she wanted to sort of verify elements of, you know, what she didn't have. Um, and so Harvard became sort of concerned, and they uh, there was a dean who actually called Hannah and sort and offered to fly down to D.C., where Hannah works in our D.C. bureau, um, to meet with her. And Hannah immediately said, you know, knowing that this dean had access to all of the data on all of the faculty members, no, I'll come meet you in Boston. 
uh, and you know, so they talked for a long time. And, and I asked Hannah about this actually, um, and I'll just read a little bit of what you know her response to me was. She said that um, I spent several hours with this, this dean as she walked me through the entire 100-year history of faculty at the school. I confirmed the pipeline language that I wanted to use for the graphic, and. Uh, she said, I had been concerned that, that using that phrase was going too far, but this dean herself used that phrasing. And at the end of the interview, she went into the, the database to fact check and start the start dates for the remaining faculty on my list. So Hannah, uh, you know, was able to sort of turn the conversation around and, and turn it into a situation where this dean was verifying uh, her story, essentially. And I'm, I'm explaining all of this, and I haven't even shown you her work, so the graphic, I'll, I'll run through it here in a sec, but, or actually, we'll just watch it play. So you start off with men and women on the faculty at Harvard Business School, and then you look at uh, tenured professors. Um, it's a little look at the number, they're very organized by the number of years that they've spent at Harvard Business School. And then you see those who are sort of in the pipeline, that there are many more men in the pipeline than there are women. So this is, this is she, she ended up, I think, where she wanted to end up, which is this, uh, you know, hard look at what Harvard was doing, you know, not, not quoting a number of, uh, you know, administration people at Harvard and trying to come at it that way, but actually putting numbers to, you know, what Harvard was attempting to do. And, you know, you can hopefully tell just based on my explanation what that effort was like it was. It's it is real journalism that is going on on the desk, um, you know, and it is happening in parallel with, um, you know, Jody Cantor was not even fully aware at times of what Hannah was doing. So there, there were communication communicating at times, and sometimes they were just sort of working in parallel, uh, and that's often the case with what we do, um, where especially on breaking stories where. Really, there's not a lot of time to be coordinating, communicating. We have to pursue the information that we're going for. They have to pursue theirs. Um, but often, it's it's difficult to to uh, to get. And I'll just you know these are these are some sketches that Hannah went through. Um, you know, it's like a little bit of a histogram approach. Uh, she thought you know it might break down into four steps. I mean, the the design for this piece um, ended up being kind of the easiest part of it. The really what was the struggle was getting the information. Uh, the, other th the other thing too that it, well, I think we want to emphasize is that uh, we very much we don't view the graphics desk as a service bureau for the newsroom. Like we view it as a de we view it as a desk like a desk like the national desk or the metro desk or the foreign desk. Where like we have journalists and like we are covering stories visually, um, and so. Like, while there's, like, obviously a lot of what we do goes along with reporters' stories, um, you don't want to just, like, we don't want to be just waiting for reporters to come over. Because, I'll show you an example here. Um, so every month on the first uh, Friday of every month, um, except for this month, thanks to the uh, government shutdown, the Bureau of Labor Statistics puts out the, na the update on the unemployment rate nationally. Um, and so, like, if we were just had a p waiting around for a reporter to come over and say, hey, I'm doing my monthly story on the unemployment rate, like, can you do a chart showing the unemployment rate? We'd just make a very simple bar chart. It'd be, uh, like, we'd put it in the paper, it'd be done. Like, it would show, we'd basically repeat what's in the lead of the story. Um, but since we have people in the uh, department that we are sort of tasking with the idea of, like, all right, how can we visually show what's in the news? Um, we did this a couple years ago. Um, this was uh, done when the, during the recession when the unemployment rate kept ticking up and up. Uh, Amanda Cox, who's one of our graphics editors, and Sean Carter put this together. Like, they said, you know, it's actually like the unemployment rate is like more than a single number that like comes out in that sort of headline report. Um, and because like Amanda had like a deep knowledge of the subject and had like been looking at different data on the unemployment rates and looking for ways to tell that story, she knew that like you could get the unemployment rate number, but you could also get the unemployment rate number and break it down, down by demographics. So in this case, if you are a white woman age 25 to 44 who is a college graduate, the unemployment rate is only 3.6%. But if you're a black man age 15 to 24 who never graduated from high school, nearly one out of two is out of work. So like this is in some ways like a pretty simple form for this like graphic. It's just a bunch of charts, uh, just one chart with a bunch of lines on it. But like the fact that like the, the way we came up with this look, graphic is because like we were the ones who were like doing the research and sort of seeing like oh you know 
I've seen that like you can get the rate for like all these different subgroups. Like let's find a visual form that shows it. So nice. let's, what is the first one up in this category? Oh, okay, all right. It's just work. This, this is an expression that we use uh, with some regularity in the department. It, you know, we come up with an idea, it's like, hey, that's a great idea, how are we gonna get it done? Uh, it's just work, um, which it means that it's probably a lot of work. Um, and, you know, we are, you know, I think we've made the point that we're, we're journalists and so we're sort of energized by uh, news and breaking news. Um, and, you know, different kinds of stories are interesting, but we cover, uh, you know, serious stories, natural disasters. And, and so this is the tornado earlier this year in Moore, Oklahoma. And this is the print graphic that ran. Uh, so we found out about, we found out that the, the tornado had occurred, I think, in the afternoon and scrambled to get some things together for the site immediately and then for the next day's paper. And then the next day we came in and sort of tried to figure out what we were going to do. So I'll just show you some of the, like, details, the clearer version, the PDF of the, that page. And you can see that we've, you know, within about a day of uh, finding out about the tornado, we've, we've tried to quantify the scale of the event, right? So we're showing the path that it took through this town and we're actually counting, building like house footprints to indicate this is the amount of, you know, destruction that, that the, her the tornado caused. And there's a little bit of <coughs> uh, annotation along the bottom where we describe uh, some of the buildings where there was a lot of damage and uh, where there were many casualties. And, um, and we put numbers to this, you know, we sort of say, you know, uh, it was at least this many buildings that suffered this. Um, and, you know, this is similar to the Hannah's project where there's no, no one is providing this data to us. You know, there are organizations that will go in and start to count this stuff like FEMA and, uh, you know, local organizations, but they're not coming out with that data within a day. And so, you know, when I say it's just work, um, this is brute force counting houses, basically. There are, you know, so Reuters, AP, all the wire services started to set, started to, you know, um, take pictures, and some of those were aerial pictures, and so you get a little bit of a sense of, um, you know, what the scale of, of the destruction is. And this is our source material for this piece. So <clears throat> we started to look at, uh, you know, Google Maps as a satellite view, and you can find, different landmarks um, in, in these aerial photos uh, where you, you can identify different rows of houses as being the same as the ones in the Google satellite image. And then it's a matter, I mean, this is, it couldn't be more simple, but it couldn't be more of a pain to go house by house and count up these houses. And we're doing it, I mean, I think, you know, it's an important story. There's, there's a lot of destruction and uh, we feel like it's important for the Times to, to create a record of what, you know, the, the volume, the scale was. Um, and you know, it's not, it's not any more complicated than this. I mean, assembling the, uh, the piece, obviously there is design work to indicate clearly to readers, you know, even where, where we were drawing our source material from. There's a, there's a, there's a little uh, part of the diagram that says this is the area where uh, aerial photos were available. So we're sort of letting readers know, hey, this is the only part we can see. But the, the, the real, the hard part of this was really just the, the group of five or six graphic editors who spent a day um, counting those houses. No, and I think like, like one of the things that like where it, like the visual journalism plays off well is because like we can, since we can create figures, we can create things that don't exist in real life, like uh, the scene from earlier with Usain Bolt or whatever, or even like this, like the stuff, the, I think some of the best stuff we do is where we take things from multiple sources like in this case, we had the path of the tornado from the National Weather Service. We had the aerial photos from the wire photographers. Uh, we had reports from people on the ground. Um, and like what we can do is like we can take the best of what's uh, from each of those sources and combine them together to actually take and like make a uh, compelling and sort of informative uh, visual representation of what happened. Uh, we also, like, there's also the, one of the fun things about graphics is that there's a lot of sort of scrambling, like, you never knew that you needed to be an expert on tsunamis, or um, all of a sudden, like, you're trying to figure out who's going to be laid off or furloughed during the government shutdown. Um, so we try and, like, we're pretty resourceful in terms of, like, trying to figure out, like, how can we just, like, figure out how to turn something together um, quickly. And so one of, the, one of the fun examples of this is uh, back when Hurricane Sandy was uh, approaching the East Coast last year. Um, 
we were covering in many ways. Like we had mapped the path, we had like we knew where the sort of possible areas for flooding were, we had the preparations that were being made. But we also wanted to say like, hey, is there some way we can like let our readers actually see what the storm looks like as it comes in for the people who actually aren't in the New York area? Um, so the New York Times building um, is a, we have a 50 story or so tall building. And we thought like, what if we can just like put a webcam up in like the top of the building? Um, so on a Sunday afternoon, we sat around to scrounging like, can we find a camera? Can we figure out how to hook up to a laptop? Can we get it on the internet? Um, and so went up to the very top floor of the building. It's mostly a mechanical room. Uh, but they have these tiny little windows over in the corner of the building and just hooked up a Canon digital SLR, pointed it out the window, plugged it into a laptop, cobbled together a couple little scripts on the laptop to every minute it would make the camera take a photo and then it would take that and uh, it was connected to a cellular modem, upload the photo to a web server. Um, there's another script on the web server that I'd take and scale it down and send it over to our website. Um, and the piece that resulted was just sort of this fun look, I'll just play a little bit of it here, of you can actually see uh, as this, the storm comes through, just like what the view looked like from up there. Um, and there's an interesting point here, if you look back at the beginning, pause it and go back. We were publishing them in real time about, I think it was one a minute, and then we stitched them together. You had to make a time lapse at the end. Uh, and if you watch over here, you'll see the lights go out in uh, the bottom half of Manhattan. Um, although the Empire State Building must have either battery backups or big generators because that stays on. Whoops. Right there. Oh, there. There they go. So uh, one thing, one thing I think that's also important to do um, is to actually like as you're trying to figure out like when you're doing data visualization um, is to like sketch with real data. Um, and once you've gotten data and you're doing the data analysis, like what you want to do is just like start making things, make variants of your charts, see which ones are interesting, see which ones have an interesting shape, see which ones do an interesting job of portraying the data well, um, and just like figure it like that will help you figure out like what direction am I going to head with this. Um, Amanda Cox, who's one of our colleagues, like describes this as the uh, make 500 charts and then pick the best one approach to working. Which, if you can, like, if you can do that and like you work efficiently to make 500 charts or even 10 charts, like, rather than being fixated on a form up front, like let the data sort of be the guide. Um, and so, uh, just walks you through how we ended up with a got to a project on the website that we published last year about uh, corporate tax rates. Um, one of our reporters, or actually is an editor in the Washington Bureau, David Leonhardt, um, had gotten data from a company that showed uh, for all the companies in the S&P 500 over a time period of about five years, uh, how much money they'd made and how much of that they paid in taxes. Um, and so, like, there were huge variations in how much, like some companies paid 30% of their revenue in taxes, other companies paid almost none. Um, and so Mike Bostock, who's uh, one of our graphics editors and he's a tremendous uh, web developer, just started taking that data and he just made different charts to see like what was interesting. Um, this is one where you'd have the tax rate over the left hand side, it showed the size of the company across the bottom. Um, size of the company across the bottom and then I think it's color coded by industry. Um, sort of hard to know what to make from that. He tried another one. Uh, changing the form of the scatter plot. Uh, I think this was plotting it out over like year by year for each company. Also hard to know what to make of that, although you've got this like huge mass of stuff in there and then a bunch of outliers. Then he tried, well, what if we try something ridiculous like putting lines connecting all of them? Uh, it turns out even more incomprehensible. Well, you could filter it down to maybe just an industry or not. Um, well, so we're going, the lines obviously aren't working. Um, so up here now you have uh, how much they paid in taxes and how much the, the revenue is on the bottom. Um, and to try and make this a little bit more comprehensible, you can see like there's lines that show like what the effective tax rates, 40%, 20%, 10%, 5% were. Um, but still like, it's like, all right, the, this, isn't, this isn't really working. Like there's obviously big differences between paying a 5% tax rate and a 40% tax rate, but like all of this data is sort of like clustered in the middle of the chart and there's some weird outliers that are sort of distracting overall. So we sort of changed approaches entirely. So here's just like, all right, what if we just take it by industry? Okay, let's do a simple bar chart. Um, and like, all right, here, like this is a little bit closer to actually sort of telling some sort of story. Like here you can see like trends, like utilities pay very little generally, information technology also like doesn't pay a lot. 
where things like financials and energy, uh, energy and even sort of the consumer uh, groups pay more. So they're like, all right, now we're starting to get, maybe, maybe the industry differences are somehow what we want to focus on. But we do have all this, like, you don't want to just, like, it seems like we should be able to do something more than just a bar chart. Like, can we show, like, the range of companies in this industry? This is a box plot that sort of shows, like, all right, in each of these industries, like, the center, the black center line in the middle is uh, what the average for the industry is, and then the ones on the edges are, like, how far out that goes, like, how much variation is within the industry. Uh, getting a little better still, a little hard to comprehend. And also since like we're talking big companies, like you have, like you have recognizable names and like there's some, like there's something like readers have a connection to like not just seeing like a something like integrated telecommunication services label and what the average is, but like seeing local, like maybe that's Verizon, maybe that's AT&T, these are companies I know. So what if we actually just take and like draw a circle for each of the companies to show what their tax rate was? All right, let's get a little bit better. All right, spread it out a little bit more. And then, then at this point, we're like, all right, like we might be onto something here. Okay, let's take and work with this. Uh, we wanted to give people an overview, so we thought, okay, let's do, so this maybe we'll have like an expanded view, and then we'll have like a down cl collapse down, so you can see the average was somewhere in the mid-20s. And then it was just a matter of like, how do you apply design to this to make this more comprehensible? Uh, we'll change it to a little bit better color palette that lets us sort of classify like the, the companies with the low tax rate differently than the ones with the high tax rate to sort of reinforce that spectrum. We'll add a headline, we'll add some annotation, we'll add the little button that lets us toggle between all companies and by sector. Start thinking like, all right, how can we like make clear what this is? All right, these are all the companies in the S&P 500, we'll add a label, put the show where the overall uh, breakdown falls. Uh, when I add some annotation. Um, one of the things I think that's really important, and this is produced with D3. So you could go in, like not only could you, like you'd see the patterns overall, you could find a company. Was it D3 or D? D. D. Uh, short for data-driven documents. So you could find Apple, you could see what their tax rate looked like. And then you could also go in and just click to view by industry. And the chart would just uh, split apart. Um, and so as part of this, like we also, like here, we thought it was important to do annotations also. If you could like, like, can we explain why information technology is so much lower? Like information technology, you can, like they can often move a lot of their uh, accounting costs offshore um, since they're dealing in virtual goods. Whereas other types of companies, like retailers, like if you're selling products in the US, like, it's hard for you to claim that that work is being done overseas. So like you're a little bit more tied to the, what the actual tax rate is. And there's uh, less sort of accounting games you can play on to adjust it up or down. Um, and so uh, this is sort of a repeat, a little bit of an idea from earlier as in, think about like, as you're, as you're doing pieces, think about like, what is the story you're trying to tell? Um, and so like in the case of the Mariana Rivera uh, piece, which many of you probably saw before, like in that case, like we thought, as we were looking at the data, we thought um, like, you know, we need to change the form to uh, tell the story better. But you should also think about, um, as you're doing something like thinking, like, well, what data, like of all the data I have, like what data do I have that tells the story the best? Um, and so I'll just walk quickly through another project actually on tax rates also. Uh, this time the taxes that we all pay, uh, personal income taxes and state sales taxes and local taxes. Uh, that we did a couple uh, years ago. Um, and uh, one of our database editors um, and one of our economics reporters wanted to actually just take a look and see like how had taxes changed over time. Um, and one of the things that's sort of interesting about tax data um, is that it's hard to get it all in one place. Um, we can get pretty good tax data on how much the federal income tax has gone up or down over time broken down by income group, like how much have poor people paid in the federal income tax over time versus uh, rich people in the middle class. Um, but obviously like the federal income, ta like the federal income tax has declined uh, in terms of the effective or the marginal tax rates for everyone. But one of the things also is like, we're gonna say like, hey, they want to answer the question like, well, what's happened to state and local taxes? Have they gone up to make, the di make up the difference? Or have they also declined? Like what is the overall tax situation? And also like, how can we break it down for like different types of people, like the middle class, how has the situation changed for them uh, versus the, uh, the rich and the poor? Um, and so this is where it's hard because like you have data from like, you have uh, good data from the IRS and the federal income tax. 
you have some data from state governments on state and local taxes. Um, you have also payroll taxes. But like nobody had really put it together in one place. So Rob uh, spent, I think, probably about six months trying to figure out, like, all right, can we go together and like pull all this data together? Like, what are the fact what do we need to factor in? Like, how are tax rates different in different states? How have sales taxes going up, gone up? How much do people in New York spend on average on purchases in a year that would be taxable versus people in Texas? And like, can we build an actual model of this? Um, and so here's, here's the spreadsheet basically that resulted at the end of it was, um, you have a column for like, you got your state, you have a year, you have an income group, people who made less than $20,000, and like what percentage of their income they paid in federal taxes, state taxes, um, payroll taxes, and so forth. And so then we started to think, okay, we've got all this data, like once again, it's sort of this sketchy idea, like let's work through some variations. Um, and like one of the things was, all right, first, like how much, like what's the difference? Like how much of their income overall, once you add all these taxes up to people in different states pay? And so, this is just a map of that. And like, you know, actually, instead, like, this isn't particularly interesting. We've known, like, it's pretty clear to everyone that New York is a high, prop a high tax state and California is high tax and the rest of the country is lower. Um, so how can we, like, we need to go through and just, like, find variations on our data, like, that, like, find the fields from our data that actually, uh, can, like, shows the story you want to tell. We'll work through, work through a few variations here. Um, and it was once we got to the point of like, all right, let's like the data that we want to emphasize in the visualization is the stuff that's new, which is the fact that we've broken all these taxes down by different income groups. How much do the poor pay versus how much do the rich pay? This is one of the first steps that, all right, we just, we'll just, instead of doing like one chart, let's just put a column for each, uh, like for each income group. Um, and that sort of like gave us a direction to head in. Then you always have like some missteps where it's like you think, oh, you know, actually that's sort of like that's a lot of charts. Maybe we'll just come up with one visualization that shows it all and is perfectly clear <laughs> when you look at it. <laughs> and it, it doesn't quite work. Back to the back to the line in Mala. Um, and so like that was that was sort of like how we got there. It's like all right, we want to emphasize like the the design around the story we want to tell. We'll, like arrange it in arrange it in a way that's just like designed to be very clear. Here's, here's a chart for each income group. You can see the overall tax rates for the poor. Uh, they used to, when you add all the taxes together, they used to pay 20% of their income in taxes. Now it's 19%. But for the rich, uh, they used to pay 50% of their income in taxes. It's now 42%. So it's like small difference in percentage, but you just sort of see that the drops are sort of like, the tax cuts have just disproportionately benefited the upper classes. And then we also want to walk people through, like, how do you get there? How can we structure this so that we can go through and annotate that story um, and see the charts, see the charts, but also combine it with explanation of uh, the trends in different types of taxes. So federal income tax rates have declined for everyone, but payroll taxes have gone up for everyone, but it's not, but they haven't gone as much up as much for the affluent. Um, and state and local taxes have also risen most of all for the poor. And that's sort of how you get there. So in this case, um, uh, this, uh, in this case, uh, this chart ran on almost exactly the same form in print, where we had a series of charts down the right-hand side of the page. Because uh, we were dealing with a different shape page, this is like very skinny and vertical there. There we took and pulled the annotation off to the left. Um, but this was also one where, like this is a somewhat complicated set of data. Um, so, and we looked at, Like we looked at some forms like this, where this is like it's this is like the relative share of the tax burden by income percentile over time, um, but like ultimately one of the things like that we thought was like since it's like there's a lot going on here, like we want to use in many ways use a form that's pretty simple for people to understand. Like here, the like a line chart is a very clear concept, and the organization is a clear concept. So like we wanted something that was just like people could read, like would look at this and sort of see it and understand it clearly. Okay, so what's the purpose? It, um, we are trying to do different kinds of things with different kinds of graphics, and, and you know we're we're always driven by the news event itself. And there are times when 
you know, when we're showing corporate taxes or uh, individual uh, tax rates, that we want to be very precise and it's going to be meaningful because it is precise. And then there are other uh, events where, you know, and we try to cover a lot of events. We try to cover events that are not obviously visual and that don't necessarily lend themselves to like a classic infographic. Um, and we and we also uh, draw on a lot of sources of information. So, or inspiration, sorry. So, um, so I'll just run through, you know, kind of some uh, inspirational precedents for this uh, impression ultimately that we developed to cover uh, the new pope. Um, the magazine uh, is has a staff of very talented um, designers and they did this uh, issue on London. This is in the run-up to the uh, London Olympics last summer. And they had this photography issue that was really great. And they, they, they had these this series of uh, photos, uh, actually I think it was multiple photos that were sort of stacked up in Photoshop of different, you know, locations in London and it, and it created these very beautiful, you know, sort of textured impressions of different landmarks. Um, and totally separately there was an artist who we sort of uh, found out about who had uh, had this exhibition of uh, a similar idea where he was stacking um, multiple photos to create one impression. He, this is like a stack of all like Playboy centerfolds from one year, and, and then it was done in a similar way for Vogue covers, right? And so we kind of like had this idea in our back pocket, or th there's gotta be some event that we can apply this to, and that, that's sometimes the case where we will we'll see something that is maybe purely design or, or, or like something that is fine arts, and you know, try to think about how we can apply it to uh, our kind of storytelling. And you know, we even thought, and this is, um, Amanda who put this together, uh, that we would apply this idea to members of Congress, right? So the, this is every member of the last Congress. Um, <laughs> and I mean, it's not <clears throat> difficult to put this together. This is essentially just like a low opacity for every layer in Photoshop of every member in Congress. And, but it does add up to an impression of like, you know, it, it, do we have a lot of white dudes in Congress? Um, <laughs> so what we haven't, really figured out um, you know that we, how to make that work for a serious um, piece of coverage of Congress and so uh, we had another event where <clears throat> it's sort of a similar situation um, you know that the new Pope Pope Benedict you know decided he was done and we were going to have a new Pope and you have this College of Cardinals and everyone knows that there are kind of similar people they're old men um, and so it's not it doesn't seem like it's much to express that, but when you see it, it, there's something different about seeing it than just being told. This is, you know, goes back to Matt's point about the tsunami. You can write about whole villages being swept away or you can show it. And, you know, when we show it, we reveal different kinds of things. In that case, it's a scale. And in this case, it's just the visual, you know, it's sort of startling visual impression of uh, all of this maleness. And so this is the sketch that Amanda made with all of the, uh, cardinals, you know, so we're comp we're creating this composite of the next pope, right? So the, these are the these are the men who are going to elect the next pope, and one of them will be the next pope. So this composite sort of represents the next pope, and we did it in in it, we, we did it this way. I'm sort of breaking it down by uh, region. So Italy, you had a bunch of popes, and Europe, you had a bunch of cardinals. Sorry, and North America, not quite as many, and Latin America, fewer, not very many in Asia or Africa, and then. Uh, all, which is very similar to the, the sketch that was made. And it was, it, you know, I mean, the question before about, you know, the difference between the web and print. <clears throat> um, on the web, you know, we can sort of animate it and also separate it by region and that there's something informative about that. Um, but in print, you know, this is also a piece that works. And, you know, he didn't end up looking that different from who the Pope was. So it was a reasonable impression of that story. So, like, that's, like, that's an impressionist graphic. It's, like, sort of give you an impression of, like, what the big picture is. Like, we also, like, as we do different types of stories, it's, like, you do want to say, like, all right, like, is the purpose of what we're building to let somebody look up, like, the very, very specifics? Um, so uh, Charles Duhigg um, a while ago uh, did a series uh, called Toxic Waters that looked at water quality in the U.S. 
Um, and as part of that, we worked with the environmental working group who had just compiled a huge database of all the water quality tests that were done in all the water systems in the US. It was sort of a Herculean task for them to go through like file FOIA requests, freedom of public records requests with all agencies in all the different states, get the data in, get it all into the same format. And so like in that case, like as part of that series, we did a, like a couple big picture graphics that went with it too. But we also like in this case, you know, this is a place where like you want to see specifics. Like so we want to focus like our efforts here around like let's make like design a clear form that presents the results uh, for all the water systems. You could go look up your individual water system and see like what contaminants had they tested for uh, that were above the legal limits? Which ones have they tested for that were below the legal limits, um, but above what are sort of commonly recommended health guidelines? And like design a form that's like very clear for that specific information. Um, and also like, we're gonna think about like, are there visual clues that like, when we're looking up this information too, that we can give to people? Um, where here it's like, you know, it's one thing to know uh, when we got the data from them, they basically just like flagged like which ones were above or below. Uh, the, the legal limits. But like one of the things you said, you know, we want to also like, we want to show like, is this something where it's like they tested once and they found it like five years ago and they've never seen it again? Or is it something where like, we want to show like, is there some sort of ongoing pattern here? So we just did little timelines of like the tests from each month and show like, you could see like, was this once and then like they were fine? Um, or is it things where it's like constantly testing above that uh, rate? So we want to think about like how, peop how people are going to use that and like use the design to do that. Um, in a similar way, um, we think about the same thing when it comes to election results. Um, because on an election night, uh, like we always design like a good results package because it's like obviously a big news story um, and it's something that we're expected to do. Like one of the things you want to do is you want to like be able to look up your district. You want to be able to say like, hey, um, what, how, how do the districts in Minnesota vote? So there's like, in this case, we like the form we've chosen for the uh, election results here. Um, the purpose is like a very specific one, like show geographically and let readers find geographically the results of different districts. But as we're doing this, we also want to think like, well, are there other purposes that we should be doing, that we should have in this? Like, should we be finding some way visually to show readers like, well, you can look at this map, but like, what's surprising here? Like, there's no indication on this map, like, while it's great for going, letting me go to Minnesota and see, hey, this is who won here. Like, which races should I be surprised about? So we want to come up with like a visual form that sort of shows the surprise or show, shows that story and like answers a different question. So here's, uh, this is just a simple HTML table in many ways um, of the results in all the districts uh, in the US. But we've taken and we've organized them by how the districts were expected to go. The ones that were the districts where the Democrats were expected to win uh, easily are on the left. The ones the Republicans were expected to uh, win easily are on the right. The like true toss ups are in the middle and then the ones that are a little bit leaning one way or the other in there on different sides. And so if you look at this, like you can see trends, like you can see, like is the election going more towards the Democratic side by you see more blue over on this side and more blue in the middle? Or is it more going more towards the Republican side? And you can also like by scrolling down this page, like visually surprising things become clear. You scroll down and you see, Like you see the district where there's an upset because like visually there's this one red box that jumps out of you out of a sea of blue. Uh, and something else you want to do is also um, give people like another purpose we people question people have is like how can I help understand what's going on on election night? So we're going to like give them analytic tools to understand what's going on. So here for our election results map, um, we, get, we had an election results map for the mail primary election right, that let you like not only see the results, but you could filter the map. You can say, let me go to the rich areas or the poor areas and just see how the vote differed there. So if you want to find out what the vote was in the heavily black areas, you could see who was winning those areas versus the heavily Asian areas and just sort of filter that map and give people, give people tools because like that's also some like that's a different purpose that people have for the graphics we're using. What is the next piece? Oh okay. All right. So uh, this is an artwork by Damien Hurst and this is Damien Hurst and this is one of his dot paintings behind him. 
And so there was a story that we were going to write about the dot paintings, actually. He's done like thousands of these paintings. In fact, the story was kind of about how no one knew how many of these paintings he made. But they were losing value, and there was this effort by the gallery that was representing him to uh, put out a firm number. And you know, it wasn't clearly, you know, there were some elements that were maybe obviously um, graphics, uh, but it wasn't clear how. And so, you know, the culture editor, this is, this is kind of the history of the, the graphics department where at, you know, one point in time, 25 years ago, whatever, it was a service desk. And it started out with um, uh, some cartographers and technical illustrators and so copy editors and reporters would come over with a set of data and maybe an idea for the graphic and say, here, let's make a chart. And so then gradually the, the department uh, started to do its own reporters. It hired people who were journalists, right? And then, you know, it broadened out and, and now it's a group, a very eclectic group with lots of different kinds of skills. But, but occasionally we are visited <clears throat> by the past where a, a culture editor will come by and say, here's a line chart, let's make this. And we say, let's not. Um, <laughs> so the chart that we ended up making was every dot painting made by Damien Hurst in the last seven years, eight years, at its um, auction price and uh, with a display of its actual dimensions. So if you get into the <clears throat> guts of this thing, it's a simple chart, you know, it ran, it ran in a very similar form uh, in print and on the web. It's the initial sort of visual impression that is interesting because it does kind of create that chart where you show his, the prices of these things spiking uh, and then starting to come down. But there's all kinds of richness in the graphic. I mean, you see, you know, I mean, they're stacked up so you don't see all of them, but certainly you see like the repetitive nature of these pieces and that he has made so many of them, and that they are starting to decline in value. And so it's just like a fun chart to explore. You even get little details like the skateboard and the, and the guitar that he made in the, in, as a dot painting and there in the lower right. Um, and so to create the chart, um, Matt was talking about the uh, statistical package R, which is what was used to make the initial plot, which is this. And it comes after um, you know scraping some of this data from uh, I think it was like a, a clearinghouse that collects uh, data for paintings that are uh, that appear and sell at different auctions. But we had you know the price and the dimensions, and we had even little like um, JPEGs of the of the paintings themselves. And so we were you know we were thinking about showing the paintings and maybe even showing them all in color. But it was a little bit chaotic. Sort of took you away from the overall trend. And plus there were probably like copyright issues. And so we ended up just redrawing. Sorry. Uh, each of the dot paintings ourselves. It's just like option dragging little dots on top of his dots. And then, um, so there's like, you know, um, uh, <laughs> there are two different um, parts of the, of the production. You know, one that involves your head and one that involves your fingers. Um, but we ended up with something that was, I think, vastly superior to that line chart. And, you know, there are other examples. I mean, I think hopefully what uh, is coming across here is that that we cover a lot of different stories and that we um, we try to be as open as possible about uh, how we convey these stories, how we tell these stories. Our our goal really is in being clear and compelling, you know, and covering the news. And so in this case, um, a science writer, Dennis Overby, was writing this fairly long piece about um, the team at CERN that ultimately had. <coughs> determined that the Higgs boson exists. And, you know, I think we've written a fair amount about the Higgs boson in the last five years, and every time a Higgs, the Higgs slug comes up in a meeting, a slug is just how, how we, what we call stories as they're, as they're part of the conversation in the newsroom. The question is always, well, can we explain what the Higgs boson is? Get graphics to do it. Uh, and so somehow we're signed up to do this and, and you know, it, it makes perfect sense. I mean, um, ultimately, probably the best way to convey this is visually. Um, and we decided, you know, the best way really was um, to do something very simple. Uh, you know, this is like the chart that, or the, the figure that you find if you look up Higgs boson in Wikipedia and, and you can see these other kinds of figures that aren't necessarily so clear. Um, and we ended up actually, you know, we were doing some of the, we ended up creating a bunch of illustrations and we were thinking we would do this ourselves and we decided we would work with uh, Nigel Holmes who normally does this sort of thing, these sort of highly stylized infographics that we may or may not like, um, but we know him pretty well and, and 
you know, Nigel's been around for a long time. Certainly we respect him. Um, and we know him well enough to know that like he occasionally sits in Manhattan jazz clubs and has a sketchbook full of like very gestural drawings that he makes of the drummer while he's playing or the, you know, the other musicians. So he said, Nigel, let's not do this. Um, why, why don't we see if you can do something that's more like your jazz drawing? So, so Nigel submitted a bunch of uh, illustrations and we sort of worked through a script. Uh, I think at least one component of the script somehow included Darth Vader. Uh, <laughs> And, and uh, you know, I'm not going to show you the whole thing, but it was, it was a simple step-by-step -step, um, sort of analogy that we we're making. Um, you know, we talk about it compared to like a molasses. It, it is this field that, that creates mass for different other particles that flow through it. And then we said to go into this metaphor of like a field of snow and different people working their way through it. But I mean, the point is that um, this in many ways is the opposite of you know, uh, a data visualization of corporate taxes, just in terms of how you come up with a solution. But we have, the desk is so varied in terms of the kind of creativity that exists there and, and the different kinds of expertise that we feel like we're flexible enough to um, cover stories however they are, are best covered. Oh, all right, so actually, you know what? I'll start this next one um, here. Oh, wait, hold on. Okay, let's see if we have sound. The Chinese government plans to move 250 million people from farms to cities. It plans to do this over the next 12 to 15 years. We're passing over some of the world's largest urban areas, and if we combine the population of all of these cities, we'll reach 250 million people, eventually. The scale of China's project is staggering. If it works, millions of farmers will move from their homes into newly built apartment blocks. Critics of the plan have called it warehousing. These major American cities represent only a fraction of China's goal. We get closer to the total if we add some of Europe's largest urban areas. If the Chinese government reaches its goal, 70% of its people will live in cities. The same transition took centuries in Western countries. At 85 million, we approach the number of Chinese villagers who have moved to cities since 2008. That past migration happened naturally. Farmers found jobs in cities and moved. It was part of a transition that had been underway for decades. China's current plan is far more deliberate and will happen faster. Farmers will now be forced to relocate. Even with some of Western Europe's major cities behind us, we're not even halfway there. We'll need to add many of the largest urban areas in the world. The government is hoping the farmers become urban consumers. Villagers typically grow their own food and... All right, so I think you get the idea. <coughs> China is a big country. Um, <laughs> hopefully. Uh, you know, I mean, and this, this um, sort of marries the two things that, we t that <coughs> I mentioned before, which is like um, the Nigel Holmes piece is a very somewhat simple artistic form. Um, and, you know, corporate tax rates where we're dealing with... Dealing with um, a more complex data set and certainly a more uh, complex way of working in order to sketch with it and come up with a final visualization. And this this piece, I think, all ties to both of those and also to the Usain Bolt piece that I showed in the morning session where you have what is ultimately a simple data set. Like, with this, this concept that there are 250 million people who are going to be moved from rural to urban areas and how do we, so, you know, you could, you could say, well, it's the total of you know these 20 cities, and do a bar chart of those cities. That's not really going to have much impact, and it's not going to get people closer to the concept, to getting their heads wrapped around the concept. So you know, the inspiration here is like flying over cities at night, and and just not necessarily knowing the number of people that you're sort of flying over, but getting a sense of vastness and 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 urban density. And so that was so it was like a question that we posed to Derek Watkins, who's a cartographer in the department, he's like, oh, okay, so I'll, I'll start to think about how, maybe there's an idea that we can do, maybe we can sort of like make one city that's just a giant 
you know, sort of made up uh, urban grid where we know what the population of it is and let you fly over that for five minutes. And then we started to think about the cities and ultimately he ended up um, working with uh, street data from OpenStreetMap, which is this huge database of user generated street map data that he <coughs> downloaded. And this is after he sort of figured out which cities we would need to add up in order to get to 250 million. Um, and then the piece was, so managing that data, there's some complexity there just in terms of uh, working, but he's moving the data that he's downloading through uh, GIS software that he's using and ultimately exporting them as uh, TIP files that he then, you know, uh, through trial and error figures out what, what this like enormous action needs to be in order to make these into something that looks that look like cities at night. So this is like, I think the total of his action uh, that he ran on each of those street grids. And then, you know, you like just, you can just kind of go through the different stages of what happened. And ultimately you get to a place where you're pretty close to uh, what a city looks like at night. That's his, uh, that's his illustration on the left and that is a, f a photograph of, of Manhattan at night on the right. Um, and then, you know, he worked with Graham Roberts who started to bring these in and create a path with them uh, in Maya and then there's a little bit of After Effects work to uh, do the labeling and animation and sort of finesse of it. Um, but, you know, it takes, um, it ties into the form idea, it ties into a lot of other ideas. Obviously with the form we want to do something that is impactful and like compelling. And there's this combination of, you know, some projects are, are more brute force in, in terms of how we make them uh, simpler. Some require, you know, uh, have this learning curve that Matt is talking about to become familiar with the technology. Um, and some are a combination. I think this kind of is that kind of project, um, but ultimately is probably a, uh, a compelling form. One of the things I think you want to think, like we always think about is doing this is like, what is like, when people actually like react to something that we create, whether it's visual, like, how are they, like, how are they perceiving it? And like, what is the picture that they're actually taking away from it? And like, one of, like, we obviously want to create compelling forms, but I, like, by far the most important thing for us is that like the presentation is like a clear and honest and accurate presentation and representation of the data. Um, so then, like, we always are juggling like, like what is the right content to explain the story? Like what is an engaging form? And like what is the, like what's a presentation of the data that doesn't distort the data? Um, and like we want to make sure that everything we do like uh, hits those notes. But like most importantly, we don't ever want to do anything that distorts that data. Um, and actually, for, so for an example of that, I'll look at um, the uh, election maps that we run in the newspaper uh, the day after the election. Um, this is a map of the presidential vote in 2008. Uh, every county in the U.S. is colored red or blue um, by whether it went Democratic or Republican. Um, and this is a 100% factually correct map. Like we could run this in the New York Times and like it'd be perfectly fine to run. Like you wouldn't, there's nothing wrong with running it. Um, but like as part of like generating this map, um, like if you actually look at what the popular vote was back in 2008, um, Obama got 68 million votes, McCain got 59 million votes. Um, but if you look at that map, like the amount of red and blue on that map, oh, there's only 850,000 square miles of blue because Obama won many densely populated areas like the cities, the East Coast. And McCain, there's uh, 2 million square miles of red for McCain um, because he won many sort of like very unpopulated areas out West. So like as we're thinking about like how do we present the results of the election that like sort of lets you sh see the geographic trends like that's one of the things that bothered us a little bit is that like there's this disparity between um, between the vote and the square miles of red and blue on that map. So like we thought like you know when people look at this map like the picture they're going to take away is like that like the vote was there's more red than there actually was. So we thought like is there some better form that we can use to actually show the results of the data that sort of gets around those problems. Um, one well, of the first things you can do is obviously like if a county is like a red county or a blue county, it's not like every single person in that county get, got together and decided, okay, today we're all gonna vote for McCain. Um, like most counties are somewhere like 60%, like for every 10 people, six vote for Obama and four vote for McCain or vice versa. So we thought like, well, maybe we can shade the map so that it's a little bit, uh, the colors are like, the light colors are the ones where it's very close in the county, the darker colors are the ones where it's a blowout. Like that helps a little bit. You can see places like Iowa and Minnesota 
uh, where uh, the states are much closer, like most counties were more evenly split. But you still have a problem where like out in the west, um, the like sparsely populated areas are being overrepresented and out in the big cities where like very small cities, you can't even see like how many votes came from Manhattan. Um, so we, we looked around and see what, see what other people are doing. This is a cartogram. Uh, it's a mapping form where uh, each county is distorted by a mathematical algorithm to the size of the uh, number of votes in that county. Um, it's like on one hand, it's a lovely thing. Um, and uh, we try and use cartograms in the paper sometimes when we can like make them work. But like in this case, like there's so much distortion. It's like not like it's a challenge to try and find like Where's Minneapolis here? What's like, I can't tell where Texas or Kansas or Ohio is like, so it's not, it didn't seem like something we could run in the paper. Uh, we look at things like, what if we extruded all the counties in 3D? Like the counties that had a greater margin of victory, the height would be proportional to uh, the number of votes. Like that solves some problems. Like you can see, like, look at how important, like LA and Chicago delivered like really huge margins for Obama compared to the rest of the country. But there's like still problems too. Like, Outside of like about four or five or six major areas, it's hard to really make out any trends there. Like the rest of the country is just flat. And you still have a problem where like, if you look at uh, Los Angeles and you look at Chicago, they're about the same height, about the same margin of victory for Obama. But because Los Angeles is a physically bigger county, it feels like it has more weight on that map and you sort of perceive it as being more important than Chicago, even though they're equal loosely. We've tried things in the past, like here, we've basically just taken and put white out over any area of the map that has uh, less than three people per square mile. That solves a lot of the problem out west, but you still, it's not really helping you understand the role of the cities because they're still pretty small blue dots. So ultimately, sort of what we settled upon is we thought it was sort of the best visual representation of like what was his actual vote totals. It was a map where we just drew a circle over each county, shaded it by whether it went for Obama or McCain. And each circle was sized according to the margin of victory in that county. So you could see like LA and Chicago, like the two biggest source, like single sources of like margins uh, for Obama. But you could also make out other patterns. Like you could look around Texas and see like the cities pop in Texas and how like mostly around Dallas it was re went Republican, but there's one county that went Democratic. But you still like with any mapping form, any form you choose for charting will give you like cause you to have problems in some, like they all have pros and cons. Um, so out on the East Coast, you can't make heads or tails of what's going on in New Jersey. So when it came to actually, what do we want to put in the paper to really convey the story of the election? We decided that like a combination of mapping forms would really be the ones that like sort of gave you that information clearly, but also like painted a picture that was sort of like we felt was reflective of the actual results. So the big map was the proportional symbols map, but down in the middle, you also had a little map by county. So you could like, if you needed to see like a little more detail about what's going on the East Coast, you could answer that there. Um, and just sort of like combining that forms to tell the story. Uh, so the world, world would be boring if there were just bar charts. Maybe just bar charts. Scatter plots are actually pretty interesting. Um, <laughs> but okay, so this is, you know, probably the, um, the most unusual, you know, graphic that we made uh, recently. I mean, we, we incorporate. Um, video footage in some of our visual explanations. And I think uh, the, the point here really is just that, um, again, that we're looking to cover all kinds of things and we don't want to be limited. Um, and really what we're doing as we pursue graphics is, is pursuing explanatory journalism. And that, that doesn't, it shouldn't be boring. And you know, there are times when we're trying to make points that have some level of complexity and we understand that some of those figures just require more than a moment's thought to absorb them, but uh, we're not looking to inflict pain on readers. And uh, so we want to tell stories in compelling ways and use the kinds of devices that filmmakers use and writers use and, and you know, different sophisticated sort of methods of telling stories. And so <clears throat> there's a long profile that the Times published earlier this year about a jockey who was the winningest jockey uh, in North America, I think the world. Um, he's 54 years old and you know, a lot of people, really most people never heard of him. Um, and so, you know, the sports editor uh, talked to us about pursuing a couple of things and, and, you know, mentioned this idea of, you know, annotating a race, you know, so maybe you take the racetrack and you can call out little quotes from the, you know, jockey about how he, 
um, how he rides. And that would be, you know, the sort of knee-jerk uh, infographic uh, approach. Um, but one of the graphics editors, um, Shaquin um, Gonzalez Vieira, um, thought, you know, it might be nice to get a GoPro camera actually on the jockey's helmet. And so we pursued that a little bit. The racing board shot us down. And so then he said, you know, well, why don't, what about these goggles that I found on, you know, the internet? Is, is there any chance the, the jockey would wear those? Um, so we started that effort. You know, the reporter started to do the legwork to see whether or not the racing board would, like, let us do it. And also whether or not he could make the jockey comfortable enough actually wearing these in real races. And while that was going on, um, I'm going to skip ahead. We were sort of testing out uh, these goggles. So this is Sean Carter in Berkeley uh, on his street, on his bike, uh, almost getting hit by a car. But I mean, we were, became confident that um, if you know we could get the jockey to wear these and get permission to do it, that we could create something that was pretty compelling um, from the jockey's point of view. So. So that sort of ballooned just in terms of the scale of what we were going to do. We, we had access to the track for two races, and so we, we had, you know, I think there were 18 cameras ultimately that we were operating either with like the four people who were there or by remote, or they were GoPro cameras that we set up on the, the gate, and you can see, you know, a little bit of testing, and this is the camera on the gate, um, and this was the plan for where we would put the cameras. You know, we had in mind kind of what we wanted to capture because we were going to try to ultimately tell the story of a race from the point of view of a jockey. We wanted the jockey to explain to readers what he does in a race. Um, that's explanatory journalism, and it, it falls well within you know the range of what we do, even if it is ultimately a, f a video that we um, that we assemble. And so the footage that came back after the jockey said that he would. Um, he was game. Uh, he tried it out on a couple of um, sort of training runs, and it didn't look so promising because mostly you just get the horse's ears flopping. Um, but we still did it. We, you know, we sort of adjusted it so that he was going to not wear them on his on his eyes, but he would attach them to his helmet. He is an adrenaline addict, and horse racing satisfies the craving. You never lose the thrill of having that gate come open and the feeling of that horse surging up beneath you, he said. I go into the starting gate, the main thing is to have the horse relaxed but alert. I'm also looking at the starters loading the other horses so that I know approximately when that last horse goes in. I can reach up, grab my finger, hold the mane, and as soon as I see that crack start to get a little wider, then I holler at the horse and away we go. In the race on Friday, I had a horse that had good speed. There was another horse that felt like he wanted to lead at the same time, so, you know, we kind of went ding-dong and head-and-head for a while. If they're a come-from-behind horse, you know, you're going to be farther back in the group. And then you also have to keep in mind whether they like to be inside or a lot of things you have to take into consideration as you're getting ready to go into that first turn, but you also want to be in a position so that you're not going to go real wide into the turn and lose a lot of ground. When you're in the back stretch, you're managing the output of your horse. You can feel through your hands how they're moving over the ground. If you're gonna have to move through the pack, you've gotta see not just the hole in front of you, but you've gotta see what you're gonna do after you get through that hole. In this particular instance, I was just kind of surrounded by horses that weren't going anywhere and I kind of had to let them get clear of me a little bit, and then I was able to drop in and kind of slingshot through on the inside of them. When you're coming around that second turn, you've been paying attention to what the other riders are doing, how much horse they've used. You want to have your horse in a position at that point that if you have some horse left, you're going to be able to let him run and hopefully win the race. <laughs> 